Good afternoon. Welcome on behalf of the History Department and the UCSC campus. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming. I have always thought of alumni of UCSC as rainmakers, and when I woke up in the middle of an unaccustomed downpour last night, I thought, come back more often, why don't you all? <laughs> My name is Gail Hershatter. I'm a professor in the History Department. Uh, I can't say that I'm an old timer. I only got here in 1991, so you all have far longer histories than I do here. Um, but I did go to Hampshire College, which was founded in 1970, very much in the spirit of UCSC. And so as someone who was at a school like this in its inaugural years, I have an attachment to founding visions and early mem memories of early experiments in education. And as a historian, of course, I also have an attachment to hearing all the ways that founding plans can go awry and sometimes turn into something much more interesting. Um, and like most of you, I'm sure I love a good story. So I'm very much looking forward to this. What I'm going to do is first introduce all the panelists at once so I don't have to interrupt them later. Um, first, on my immediate left, Professor Peter Kennis, who is, his title is Professor Emeritus of History. I'm very skeptical about the emeritus part because I keep running into him in the halls and he is still teaching. Um, multiple generations of UC Santa Cruz students recognize his name. He's a PhD, holds a PhD from Harvard University and has taught uh, Russian, Soviet, modern European history at UCSC since 1966. And I was reminded to make sure to say that in 2016, he will be celebrating his 50th year on campus, I think still teaching at that moment. Um, so. Uh, he is the author of many critically acclaimed books about Soviet society and about the Holocaust, as well as a memoir published in 1995 about growing up under Nazism and communism. Um, it's not uncommon for students to ask, does Peter Kenna still teach history here? My dad was a student of his, and if he hangs around much longer, we're gonna get into grandchild territory. <laughs> this is quite possible. Our, our second panelist who is at the far end over there is, is David Thomas, who is Professor Emeritus of Politics. Professor of Politics at UCSC from 1966 to 1999 and a founding faculty member of Stevenson College. From 1981, he taught a course whose final title was Sexual Politics, Queer Politics. That was its final title. By tracing the name ch changes, you could write a history of sexual and gender politics in the late 20th century. Uh, and I think it probably would have kept changing had he kept teaching it. The course was a major contribution to queer life at UCSC and was one of the first of its kind in the United States. And I just want to um, alert you that he's been interviewed by Irene Reddy of our library for the UCSC Oral History Project. And if you want to know more after today's panel, I suggest you go to the library website and read the very detailed and moving uh, transcript of his interview there. Third panelist over here is Greg Herkin who is a distinguished UC Santa Cruz alumnus and also a bit of a student faculty hybrid. Uh, he writes, in the spirit of full disclosure, it should be noted that I transferred to UCSC in 1967 from UC Davis. So even though I graduated in the pioneer class, I did not have the experience of living in the trailers. I realized, you see, this is code for all kinds of things, you, you, which you had to have been here. He says, on the other hand, I taught my first class at Crown in fall 1972 while I was still a grad student in absentia from Princeton on the history of the Cold War. So I guess I can claim both student and faculty status at UCSC. Um, he's Professor Emeritus of History at the University of California, one of the founding faculty members at UC Merced, also taught at Oberlin and Yale, and the author of five books, among other topics about the bomb, Cold War politics, and science advisors to the president. Finally, Linda Peterson, Stevenson, 1970, who currently serves as a UC Santa Cruz Foundation trustee. Did you just tell me you're chair of the campaign? For, yes, she is the chief of the current campaign for UC Santa Cruz and recently retired as associate general counsel at Occidental Petroleum. Her career, aside from her career career, includes 10 years as director of the Mary Magdalene Project, which is now being renamed the Journey Out Project, which has to do with um, providing resources to sex workers in case they would like to leave that life. 
president of the Los Angeles chapter of the American Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals, and founding member of the board of directors of Theater by the Blind, now called Breaking Through Barriers, a New York City-based theater company that works with the disabled. She's also a member of our Humanities Dean's Council, and in the history department, we think of her as our patron saint. Um, the prizes that we award our undergraduates for some of the best work produced here each year bear her name. Like the lawyer she is, she has provided a disclaimer which goes like this. In any case, I reserve the right to claim age-related memory disorder and to point out that I was a goody two-shoes, so I only heard about the parties at Professor Shipley's, etc. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I have to say that collecting the emails preparing to introduce this um, left me very curious about <laughs> what all these people are going to say. So here's the format. I've asked each of these people to talk for up to 10 minutes each, and I will warn them when they have two minutes left because several of them are professors, and <laughs> I know what that means. Um, and I asked them to think about the following questions. What stands out in memory about what UCSE was when you arrived, about what it became during your time here, about who you became, about how the place was shaped by you and the people around you? What was it like to be a teacher or a student? Um, after they speak, I'll ask them a question or two, invite them to ask each other questions, and then open it up to questions from the floor. And if the audience is too shy, I will keep interviewing them. But I somehow think, after listening to this roll call of protests that people went to, that people were engaged in about 10 minutes ago, that speaking out will not be a problem. So thank you again for coming. I'll turn it over to Peter Kenneth. Let me start by uh, saying something which will undermine the rest of what I am planning to say. <laughs> um, first, I want to start out by saying that it is characteristic of old people to uh, think back of the past in rosy, col in rosy colors, which is uh, quite misleading. We think of the past better than it really was, because we were younger, because now we don't feel the pain uh, which we felt then. Well, having said this, uh, I believe that those first years were really wonderful. <laughs> uh, the Santa Cruz was a special place. It came into being, as you know, it came into being as to correspond to the felt needs of the time, namely uh, the rejection, the repudiation of what uh, Clark Kurt called the multiversity. Uh, here we were to have uh, contact with the students. What a strange idea it seems in, <laughs> in, in uh, 2015 or whatever year it is now. Uh, uh, it was possible. Uh, it was possible, and again, as you know, uh, this place was extremely selective. We could afford to pick uh, the best. Uh, I understand that in the first years, UCSC uh, had higher uh, SAT scores than Berkeley and Stanford. Um, and indeed, uh, uh, for students to be interested in, uh, in getting a job or making money was considered somehow demeaning. Uh, we were here for the, the, the pleasure of learning. And when we had a seminar, uh, the, the problem was to uh, keep them down uh, uh, rather, than to, uh, rather than to make them talk. Make them talk. That, was, uh, that, was never, that was never a problem. Now, this, of course, couldn't last. Uh, it couldn't last. Uh, uh, times have changed. Uh, the people who came here as students in the 1970s, where the economic situation of the country was different, it was appropriate for them to be interested in getting a job. What are we, how, what I'm doing here will have anything to do with the money which I'm going to make. But not only the students, the faculty. Because people who came in the early years were also attracted to the idea of we will have close contact with students. Um, now, 
their terms of scholarly output, this was not a brilliant group of people. <laughs> but in terms of caring for our students and being involved in teaching and taking that job seriously, this was a very good faculty. Now, what happened later on? Um, Santa Cruz was a good job. Um, there were fewer and fewer jobs available. Um, and uh, people came here um, for, they were not so much, they did not so much care about the idea that we have a feeling, a special mission or, or what have you. So, uh, nothing lasts. Uh, this was perfectly predictable. We were expensive. I mean, uh, faculty, for example, um, were TAs. We were TAs in each other's courses. Uh, I was a TA in, uh, in Dennis McAdams' sociology course. Uh, and uh, uh, my good friends were TAs in my class. And, well, and the idea that we could teach courses together. We could teach seminars on which there would be, I don't know, five to 10 students and two faculty members. Uh, no, we don't do that much anymore. Uh, well, what did we expect? I mean, we should have known this is not going to last. Now, having said this, I remain a, a, a UCSC patriot. I, I think that this is a fine place to be. And uh, as I was saying to, uh, to, to Jerry New, this has been a good run. It's, it's OK. It's over. <laughs> You have just heard a classic Peter Kenes take on life. Some of you may recognize it, but I just, it is, it is a genre of its own. <laughs> okay, our, our, our next speaker at the other end of the table is another professor emeritus of politics, David. Uh, the first thing that came to mind when <clears throat> I was asked uh, to participate in this was that uh, very well-known opening sentence in uh, uh, Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. And then I immediately realized that didn't apply, because it really was the best of times. <laughs> um, it, it was a. I think both personally and historically for the, for the campus, it was a magical period. Uh, and it existed because a number of factors conjoined came together, which there was no reason uh, that they should. But they all happened to come together uh, in that period. There was a general economic buoyancy. I mean, those were very prosperous times. Uh, parents had money. The kids, kids had money. Uh, housing was cheap in Santa Cruz. It was, uh, it was not an era when people were working, students were working several jobs and taking out terrible loans uh, in, order to, in order to get through. It was a unique, it was also a unique political moment. This may be less recognized, but I think you can make a good case that Santa Cruz, UCSC, um, was one of the last product creations of the New Deal. Um, there were two great late New Deal figures in the political scene uh, in those years. One was Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and the other was Governor Pat Brown, uh, the father of our current governor. Uh, <clears throat> 64 to 65 was the last uh, systematically progressive Congress that the United States has seen. It ended in 1966, just as we were being founded. And my, some might remember, um, I remember going down to hear a campaign speech 
Night, the fall of 66 was the year that Ronald Reagan was elected, uh, <clears throat> but he didn't, but Pat UCSC had already been founded. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the site was, as we all know, the site was extraordinary. I mean, this incredibly beautiful old ranch, um, which was still intact because of the wealthy Cowell family, um, <clears throat> unspoiled redwoods, and a founding chancellor who really cared about the site. But also, this funky town, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, the city of Santa Cruz was a really weird place. It was, it was a backwater. Uh, it, to many people in California, Santa Cruz is still best known as the home of the boardwalk. Um, it was kind of a, of a low-scale resort community. Uh, and amongst other things, there were, uh, <clears throat> there was lots of cheap housing because uh, people had summer cottages here and summer homes. I, for a year, I lived on Pilkington Street, uh, a block and a half from, the, from Westcliff. Uh, and those homes were vacant nine months of the year, and so you could get them for a song. I, my rent was $100 a month. Uh, but in addition, Santa Cruz County was a, was a right-wing political county. It was one of the most Republican counties in Northern California. Uh, Santa Cruz County had four John Birch Society chapters. <laughs> and uh, they, wanted the, they wanted the university here for economic reasons, but they never knew what hit them. <laughs> <laughs> A few years later, the first um, marijuana initiative, uh, and there were campus precincts by then, uh, precincts, voting precincts, that, which were exclusively college dorms. And I remember the vote uh, on the marijuana initiative came in roughly 1,627 yes, uh, 23 no. <laughs> that was not what the town fathers wanted. <laughs> The students, as, as Peter have already said, many of you people, were exceptional. Uh, you were the you know, highly, highly selective. Um, I had just come from being a teaching fellow <clears throat> at Harvard and had taught very good, very good undergraduates. And I was amazed um, that the students here in those very first years were as good uh, as the students that I had taught. Uh, in Cambridge, uh, not quite as well prepared, but very, very able students. And imaginative, with uh, independent, uh, in, rather innocent in those first years. This is the, the founding year was the early, still the early 60s, before it had gotten heavy, hard, and dark. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, I can give you one. Gail asked for a story. My best story about undergraduates is not in the classroom, but I was the uh, dorm resident in dorm four right over here. And I had an all freshman floor of guys. This was an experiment. This experiment, <laughs> this experiment was not repeated. Uh, <laughs> they, they, there two, two, two of them. Two of them were still very good friends of mine. Uh, but they were rambunctious. They were inventive. They got into artillery uh, in, <laughs> with water bombs, balloons filled, balloons filled with water. <laughs> and they started shooting them off of the uh, out of out of the top of the roof, yes, out of the roof. Thank you, thank you. And they had amazingly uh, great skill. And well, I, there was there was yeah, there was one there was one occasion uh, in which um, a colleague of mine, a, a, a woman, rather proper woman, a faculty member, with a, 
East Coast back, background was over yonder in the uh, near where the coffee house is now. And my boys from the top <laughs> shot a balloon which scored a direct hit, <laughs> not on her head, not on her feet, but right in her crotch. <laughs> And it exploded, and she had she had a huge wet spot there. Uh, well, I mean, it was brilliant, and, <laughs> and it was hilarious. You know, you could not. I just, you know, barely was able to contain myself from laughing. But I knew this was the moment. I had to get those guys under control, or I would have lost it for, for the year. So I called a meeting of the third floor that night and read them the riot act as best I could. And I think it was touch and go, but I won. <laughs> they behaved from then, then on. And as I said, they were, became some of, my, some of my best friends. Then there was the, the faculty. Um, <clears throat> who were pretty rambunctious, too. <laughs> um, an interesting group, a quirky group, uh, some conventional, a number not so conventional. And here I want to say a word about uh, the founding provost, Charles Page, who is little known to the undergraduates because he was only here two years. He was here the hiring year before we opened and the first year, uh, and then he left. Oh, two minutes already. Well, well I, I've got a lot more. But, uh, <laughs> and and uh, Charles Page had, I, would, I think, had remarkable taste uh, in people and also uh, academically. And he hired a faculty that was rather different uh, from the Cowell faculty. Um, this, the f one thing about the faculty is that a number of people were starting kind of second lives themselves. I mean, we were all quite young. And for some of us, it was our first job out of graduate school. But there were others who were uh, leaving broken marriages, leaving ear earlier parts of the It was the classic reason for going west, uh, for many of us, to, st to start over. Um, we worked very hard. Um, if any of you have ever had the, ex the experience of teaching a full set of courses for the first time, it's a huge amount of work uh, preparing. Um, but we also partied very hard. And not just at Bill Shipley's. Uh, <laughs> that, was a good, that was a good spot. Uh, it was at one of those faculty parties uh, that I smoked pot for the first time. Of course, the students were ahead of me there. <laughs> um, I could go on, but I will say at the end of that first year, um, there was a faculty party. And uh, I was awarded uh, the Salminio Award for Best Adjustment to California Life. <laughs> that is one of my most treasured honors. Um, well, I guess the tradition now is to stand here. Um, well, um, I have a confession to make, actually a second confession. I was not in the trailers, but also I was in dorm four, and I was the spotter. <laughs> we, we fired from, I also know the whole story, we fired from that little balcony affair there, and of course you could, we had to fire over this building, and you couldn't see where they were landing, so they had to be a spotter there, and I would sort of on the side, you know, do up. Or, or down, or whatever, and, and I was there on that famous occasion, and I remember when I saw the balloon arcing over, and I saw the professor uh, uh, that we were talking about there, I thought, this could be trouble. And, <laughs> and, and indeed, it scored a direct hit. Actually, my memory is it landed on the table and, and took out her salad, but the salad went in all directions, and she was quite animated. And, and I remember at that point, I, I, I ran back and I said, hide the goddamn thing. You know, get, 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 get rid of it and let's, let's just leave. But, uh, but that, that was memorable anyway. Uh, that was one of the memorable moments, in fact, here at, uh, at UCSC, getting to your, your question, what stands out in memory. 
Uh, what stands out uh, when I first arrived, well, uh, I, was, I was at Davis and I had friends uh, here in Santa Cruz in the town and I would drive down every weekend uh, to see my friends and one weekend the friends were not available. I knew that there was a campus here but I hadn't been up there. So I thought, well, I heard about this so I'll go up and check it out. And my immediate reaction was, how long has this been going on and uh, <laughs> how soon can I get here? So I went back to Davis and I uh, said I'd like to transfer and uh, they said, well, you'll have to wait till your junior year. I guess I was a sophomore at that point. Uh, and it's a good thing because uh, we need a more mature element at... Uh, <laughs> At Santa Cruz, and uh, and I thought at the time, Jesus, if they think I'm a more mature element as a junior, they're in worse trouble than I thought. So uh, and and it turned out that I had a friend who lived in the trailers from my high school, and I would go, come down and actually I would play hooky from Davis occasionally, and I would go to the core course. Uh, I'd sleep on the floor there, and then go to the courses, and and Don, my friend, would take me to the A frames that were out on the the field, and I just noticed the excitement about the place. That uh, that here was, unlike the students really, my colleagues at Davis, the people here were, were very excited about what they were doing. And I was floored by the fact that I, I would look at the, the reading list for the core course, and I thought, this is a killer. And yet people were asking for additional reading to the, for the faculty, I understand. So there was a, an esprit de corps that, that I had never uh, really seen before. And that, uh, and at the university, and I was really taken by that. So, um, so, um, uh, so there's there's that. What stands out in memory? I mentioned one thing uh, in particular, but uh, at at one other event, at in fact at graduation, is a friend of mine who graduated with me at Stevenson, who I think may be here, uh, said as we were before we were the students were marching into the quarry. He said, "Why don't we be the first students to march into the quarry behind the faculty?" And I thought that was a pretty bold move, but I was a history and politics major, and I thought, okay, why not? You know, we should, this is a moment of history. So we marched in behind the banner, uh, The Pursuit of Truth in the Company of Friends. And I thought that this just sort of, I don't know, inculcated or summarized or whatever the whole experience that I had had there, which had been uh, fundamental and changing. When I came from, from Davis, I was wearing stay pressed Levi's and I don't know, you know, drip dry shirts, and pretty soon it was, uh, you know, jeans and uh, Sears work shirts was the uniform of the time. And, uh, and from the change in wardrobe came a change in attitude, a change in mind, uh, and, uh, and the rest followed. Uh, what was it like to be a student? Well, uh, what I remember most is how, uh, and again, this is in comparison with Davis in part, is how small the classes were and how intimate the, uh, the whole experience was and how approachable the faculty was. Uh, and I think still, still is in, in, uh, in most cases. Um, I remember one class in particular, it was uh, Ray Nichols' class. It was political theory. And uh, I think there were no more than six or eight of us there, and that was typical of the seminar. And I, we always we looked forward to these, these meetings, these discussions, because Nichols would basically call on us, and he would let us discuss things, and then he would uh, join in, but he would not lecture to us. And I, there are a couple of occasions I remember. One is, um, we were there, we were discussing the difference between thought and action, and uh, a dog wandered into the, the classroom and threw up on the floor. <laughs> And, and Nichols said, there, that's the difference between thought and action. <laughs> yeah. so, there was, um, so there was that. And then we also read uh, Plato's Republic in that course. And, um, and in his typical manner, he invited us to discuss it. And, and we were all excited about Plato's Republic. And it was rah, rah, Plato's Republic. And what a perfect, and this should be the model for all of us in the future. And... Uh, and we were just, you know, we all went around, and that was the uniform opinion. That was the consensus. And then Nichols, who was smoking a pipe back then, uh, would lean back in his chair, puff on his pipe, and he said, uh, yes, what better word to describe the inhabitants of the Republic than slaves? And suddenly, it was as though the scales fell from our eyes, and we, and we realized, oh, you know, right, he's, he's right. Um, what was it like to be faculty? Actually, I did. I taught a class here. I was in graduate school. Uh, I, I did not love central New Jersey, so I left uh, when I could and came back to uh, what I considered my home. 
and um, taught a class. It was a history, the first class I ever taught. It was on the history of the Cold War. It was in, uh, at Crown College. And I remember, um, I mean, it was a small class. Uh, the students were, for the most part, actually, except with one exception, really quite good. Uh, what I remember was just the casualness of the atmosphere that was such a strike, striking difference from what I had been used to on the East Coast, that one of the students would come in through the window. And I never <laughs> did understand what the point of that was. And the student would bring his bicycle in, which you know, makes sense, I guess. But uh, I was used to faculty who, if you were in the lecture hall and you were wearing a hat, he wouldn't start the lecture until you took your hat off. So you know, it was uh, much more free form than what I was, uh, was used to. Um, um, well, I guess you know, that's, that's, that's enough. Um, and I'll pass the microphone to Linda. Well, as, as I said, I, I did disclaim that I was a goody two-shoes. I actually decided that maybe that was part of the reason I was chosen, because the thought was that maybe I might actually remember something from that period. <laughs> uh, I, I did remember to bring uh, some aids, and if anybody's interested later, I have the Stevenson 67 Journal with a nice picture of a very several younger members of our faculty at the time. Um, and it's quite, uh, I was asking David if he still smoked the pipe, and he says he doesn't. And there's a great one of Peter here. Um, I also brought along a much thinner version of the City on the Hill Press, and there's some wonderful articles about strikes. One of my favorites is a one from the end of the period when it was talking about what's happened to the women at Santa Cruz, because why do they no longer look as nice as they did at the beginning of the year? Um, <laughs> Uh, and I think that was Steve Schneid who wrote that, if he's still around. <laughs> Do you actually want to see how we looked? Here's the picture book. They're pretty funny. We really, uh, well, I think one of the things that stands out, it was very white, very middle class. It was a very, very different campus in that regard. Um, but it was intimidating. Um, one of the things I remember most is... You know, most of us had gone through school and we knew where we were in the pecking order. And we obviously were bright students. But all of a sudden you came here and everyone was very bright. And for me, that was totally intimidating. And I think led to my all-time favorite Santa Cruz written evaluation, which was, although Ms. Peterson is quiet in class, things do go on in her mind. <laughs> <laughs> And I've never really known how to take that, but I tried to be optimistic and assume that that was, a, was meant as a positive comment. Um, but uh, anyway, um, so I was a trailer person, but the, my, I was a second year trailer person because there was, you know, it was such a popular school, there wasn't sufficient dorm space. So uh, we had the luxury as opposed to having eight people in a trailer, there were five people in my trailer. And uh, so that was, you know, positively spacious. Although that meant that, and like well, first year where they just walked to the field house for meals, we had to walk up here. And particularly on fellows night, which um, was this wonderful, had started with Stevenson College. Stevenson College had college night. And Cal, Cal pardon me, had college night. And Stevenson had fellows night. And that was the one sit down dinner every week. And there was usually some form of entertainment with it. Uh, the men were required to wear jackets and ties, and the women had to wear dresses. So you can imagine, we had to schlep up from the trailers in nice shoes, dresses, and it would be raining. So by the time we got here, not so great. Uh, but there were some fed, but I will just say that some of those were amazing events. Um, we were talking at lunch about one very special one, which was when Glenn Wilson uh, read uh, Dylan's uh, Christmas in Wales. And I mean, it was just, you know, again, magical events, but some magical people spoke at those events and they really were very special. Um, the other, uh, th when I started thinking about this, you just, the memories did just flood in and you start thinking about all the great things. I can't look at the Stevenson Event Center without thinking of the core course and what an amazing process that was. I mean, it was a great experience because it really brought us all together we all had this shared experience, but we had different sections and different people who did it. Um, and for me, it was such an awakening because 
we were suddenly exposed to so many different points of view. It wasn't taught by one faculty member. There were, you know, it was a collective process. And in terms of, for example, Peterson's wonder, Peter's wonderful course, Culture and Society in the USSR, a, a totally different way of thinking about that country, that era, and you know, from the literature, from everything in which you did it, it was just amazing. And um, you know, I don't think I had thought about scholarship in that way before. Uh, so it was a really mind-bending experience. And um, what else do I remember? Um, I fell in love with the. Oh, I was always I was always a night owl, and I still am a night owl, but. Um, I actually would get up for breakfast every morning and walk to the library because I fell in love with the library. I thought this was the most incredible, beautiful place in the world to study. And I had a spot that I loved, and you could sit there and just, you know, I could see whoever came into the library. But um, what I loved was that it was just so beautiful and serene. And then when I could go back to the dorm, you know, at night, you'd stay up till 2 or 3 in the morning talking to everybody. Um, and how did I do that? wasn't drugs, it was, well, my drug of choice then was coffee. Um, and we would actually bring a coffee pot up to the library and put it in the ladies' bathroom and fix coffee and have seven or eight cups of coffee <laughs> over the course of the evening uh, to stay awake. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, it, it becomes a collage of pictures. And I'm sure for most of you, as you're here this weekend, it's the same way. I, uh, I see... Uh, uh, the people who lived in the trailers. I remember going to gather our sheets and towels from Steve Hill, who we called Sheet Boy. Uh, and oh, I was talking to a, a, a wonderful, you know, current graduate, current student, and I said something about Fanny Hill, and she went, "Huh?" And apparently, that term isn't used anymore for the f hill on the other side of the field. But in the when we when I by the time I had arrived, uh, in part because there were no co ed dorms and no inter visitation initially, at least not officially, um, that was Fanny Hill and you know, was an appropriate reference to literary um, convention. Uh, oh, when you mentioned Charles Page, it made me think very literally the first week of school uh, and faculty ate in the dining room, and faculty was here, and Charles Page was there, and I ended up at a table with Charles Page, and he started talking about his experiences at the University of Chicago in the 20s, including the fact that he smoked marijuana at that point, and of course it was legal. And uh, as I said, as a goody two-shoes, I was sort of like, oh my God, what, you know, this is, the, this is our provost. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what have I gotten, our, what have we gotten into? Um, but there were amazingly magical things. We had two faculty members who got married. Uh, I was in the dorm where Sigrid Maurer was our proctor, and she married uh, Barry McLaughlin, one of the professors in uh, psychology. And that was, you know, kind of magical to go to a wedding up at the Paso Tiempo Inn, as I recall. Um, you know, there were just, oh, I know. Well, one of the things about being middle class, the strike meeting. This is the only school that I've ever heard of where the strike meeting was done for Robert's Rules of Order. <laughs> Tells you how middle class. Now, we couldn't agree on government. If you take the time to look through here, I mean, the part that's quite funny is that, you know, Santa Cruz had a terrible time of trying to agree on how we were going to have student government, and we weren't very organized about it. But I think that was one of the wonderful parts about it here is that we weren't that organized. But the strike meeting was, and somebody else pointed out that while it was Robert's Rules of Order and it was a very civilized debate, it was also, um, when the vote came, it was raised fists. Um, oh, uh, and another great memory was when the Regents did show up here. And there was, uh, up, they were up at, uh, up at Crown, yes. And we were, the decision was made that unlike, you know, this is going to be a very organized and not and civil because the publicity had been so bad. This is my first introduction to manipulative politics. Um, we came, people were, they were organized, there were groups of students kind of keeping people back and there was a wide range opening so that Reagan and all the regions could walk through and it would be a good, quiet, sturdy direction. Well, instead, Reagan with his handlers cut through on a diagonal so that it looked like he was being beset by the students. And I thought, 
and it was just an eye opener in terms of manipulation in politics because his visuals for what he wanted to do, he didn't want to show students who were demonstrating peacefully. He wanted to show students. And the reason people were yelling and stuff was that they were being kicked. Um, it was a, you know, it was an incredible time. We changed a lot in that era. I mean, it went from a very, very simple time. You know, the mid 60s were very different than 69 and 70. You've got very big changes in the war. When you talk to people, people don't realize how much it changed. Um, I think for me, I realize that a lot of what I've done over the years, Santa Cruz has stayed with me and values that I earned here and the ability to have things go on my mind, maybe not to be as quiet as I was, um, came out of being here. So anyway, thank you. Well, I'm not going to monopolize the questioning for too long, but I want to ask one question and see who would like to pick up on it. One of the things about being a founding person, as you all were, is you can't just show up at an institution and have it go about its business. You're actually making it up as you go along. And so I want to know if you can think of some examples of invented customs of everyday life or institutional life that you want to have remembered. And also something about, since each of you, some of you were here for quite a long time, but I guess the shortest is the three years, the two years you would have spent here and then coming back. Um, what are the challenges of having the place get bigger? And I ask that partly because when I first got here, someone who had a while back been provost of Kresge talked about Kresge having been built, but no, uh, no kind of bus service having been built to it. People would kind of wander off to Kresge and not be seen for four years. So even in a, in a physical sense, what it mean, meant to have a campus spread out, get bigger, and have to continue to invent itself. I wonder if there are stories you'd like to tell us about that, anyone in any order. Well, we did spend a lot of time institution building. Uh, and indeed, that <clears throat> became a criticism later on that we had that the younger faculty members had spent so much time on on that process rather than on the things younger faculty members are supposed to do but part of what i remember i enjoyed that process and part of what i remember was it was so egalitarian because there was so much work to do not just running things now, but we were involved in the planning, the next college coming down, the, ne the, the expansion of the departments, so curricular planning. We were involved in hiring decisions that acting assistant professors would never have been involved in. And, uh, and for people who don't like committee work, um, it was a drag. But <laughs> if you're interested in the process of institution building, it was... Uh, Fascinating, but it was very time consuming. I, you know, I think one of the things I guess a lot of us worked on was like the early spring thing, which became, I, I, I hope it still exists, but that was quite a special, you know, the first uh, spring thing. I don't know if our year, if 67 was the first year or not, but it was this great festival down on the field and games and music and booths and uh, it was to raise money for the, um, there was a tutoring program, and the way the funds came about was through the Spring Thing booths. And I know it wasn't the first year, but it was maybe the second year that our dorm <laughs> had an ice cream booth and uh, raised a lot of money selling ice cream, and then they did it later. But, I mean, it was a great, you know, it was, it was again, a very, something joyous, but for a good cause. So... Well, even though I didn't go to the uh, the core course, I didn't actually attend it and graduate from it. But I, when I played hooky from Davis, I would uh, attend some of the lectures. That I was very much impressed with the uh, the core course. So um, when uh, I went to Merced, um, I, I thought it would be kind of a cool bookend, having been a founding in the founding class here to be on the founding faculty there. That. Uh, I was one of the most senior people just by default, so uh, I was chair of the curriculum committee. And uh, as a result, uh, UC Merced has a core course, um, and they have a uh, <laughs> and they have a common read. Uh, yeah, and we don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> on a 
Well, as, uh, as a matter of fact, when we were planning the core course, when we were planning the curriculum for the new, the 10th campus of the university, uh, Santa Cruz was the cautionary tale. That, uh, that there were problems, uh, and it was mentally alluded to, that this was a very expensive campus. There's no economy of scale to having college uh, 500 students with an administrative tail with the bursar and, and all the staff you have to go with it. So uh, UC San Diego was really the model there. Um, there was also a problem with the division between the, uh, the colleges and the disciplines uh, because the faculty would be promoted through their discipline, but they had a lot of responsibilities for their colleges. And that was one of the reasons why tenure was a, a problem for um, a lot of the faculty. Uh, we have the University of California, I think is you know, certainly the faculty here know, has an ungodly number of committees that, are, um, that one must staff. And uh, since the, we were we didn't have many faculty at the beginning. We were all on all these committees, and that's when I discovered that you, didn't, you wanted to save the junior faculty from having to serve on these committees because they had books to write and careers to follow. But um, um, one of the what I found out uh, is the committee eventually I wised up. The committee you want to be on is the committee on committees. <laughs> <laughs> there is actually such a thing and at the University of California, and the Committee on Committees chooses who is on every other committee. But you don't have to serve on those other committees. So um, it's an interesting device. Anyway. Well, uh, you remember uh, uh, there were boards of studies and colleges. And uh, for promotion, for uh, getting ahead in your field and therefore getting more money, uh, the colleges have equal say with the boards of studies. It's expensive. Okay, I will ask you one more question, and then I'm going to open it up to the floor. So I just want to say something on behalf of current undergraduates who I think are smart, engaged, hardworking, and coming of age at a very different moment in the history of the public university. Um, I'm wondering what you want to say to them about that early time beyond that it's gone, all things pass, it had to end. Um, what you see as the link between you and them. I, I really think that this is still a pretty good place. <laughs> I'm, I'm not really sure what my answer would be. Um, obviously, one can't improve the job situation. Uh, but uh, one, I was just asked on another occasion recently what, uh, what my advice would be for undergraduates here. And my advice is to get out of town, for one thing, uh, to, you know, the, to travel. Um, and to have other experiences, especially if you're a native Californian and especially if you're a native Santa Cruzan. Uh, I, I sort of half seriously suggested that every student at Santa Cruz should be required to spend uh, winters in Cleveland for at least, uh, <laughs> for, for at, least uh, at least one winter in Cleveland because they would have an exposure to a whole different way of life, a whole different climate, and, um, and they would come back with a, a whole new appreciation of, uh, of Santa Cruz. Well, I, I think being a trustee, one of the things I've gotten to see is it's one thing that I think was truly unique about Santa Cruz State. The thing is the opportunity to do cross-disciplinary work and to do research as an undergrad. And I think that that started early and has continued. And I think that's truly a very unique part of Santa Cruz. And I'm just amazed when I hear some of the things that those current students are working on and you see their work they do. Um, you know, one of my memorable experiences was doing a, a whole year-long community studies course under the auspices of Herman Blake, even though I was a history major. And that was a really special um, experience, and students today still get to do amazing things like that. And I think that's very, you know, the amount of research that our students, undergrads, get to do, I think is still unique and, and is part of that basic DNA. Well, it's kind of, of obvious, um, and I remember after having a, a bad day on campus and going home, just thinking, no matter what else happens here, it's always beautiful. <laughs> uh, and, but 
I mean, Peter is the one person who was here at the beginning and is still here, uh, still teaching. Um, I haven't taught for 15 years, uh, so I don't, I'm not really in touch uh, with the current students. But um, I am still with, with faculty and, and others who live here. And I think, uh, I hope that a certain spirit of quirkiness and originality persists. Uh, just very quickly, on, on a footnote, that are, there are, there are possibilities and options and, and opportunities here at Santa Cruz for undergraduates that we didn't have. Uh, one is uh, UCDC, the UC Washington Center, uh, which I think is a great resource, especially if you have any interest in NGOs or working for government, um, and also Cal Sacramento. So uh, there are there are options open to the current student that weren't open to us. Well, I just wanted to add that. Uh, Today, there is a spectrum uh, from the very good to the not so good. <laughs> Peter is the master of the aphorism, <laughs> the slightly enigmatic aphorism. So we're going to open this up for questions from the floor or testimonials from the floor, and we have people... Um, who are about to be equipped with mics that they can give you. If you'd like to identify yourself, that would also be great. Um, yes, back there. Hello, yes. Um, I was in the um, Porter College in 1988, and one of the, my best memories was the my, por people for alternative dwelling pad, the dorm communes, which were immune from the um, college housing office, thankfully. When I got on there, my housing problems were solved, and we had like our own kitchen, and we just enjoyed ourselves. Um, I don't believe there are any left since the 80s, and I'm wondering if there's any plans for bringing them back anywhere on campus. And one other thing, too, that I, I just uh, did a biography of myself, which is in the McHenry Library of my stay, four years, or two years stay that put a college of my pad, and I'm part of that. But if there are any... Um, plans to bring back these semi-autonomous uh, communes on campus. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm a former provost. A porter. <laughs> and I don't think there are any plans to bring it back right now. You have to realize the whole legal and other kinds of institutions that are involved with what the university has to do made some changes in those kinds of things. So I, I would check with the housing office, but I suspect not. I suppose we should ask whether the trailer, the trailer settlement up in the back of beyond there was here when you all were here, because there are still some wild, wild residential uh, communities here. Not completely off the grid, but um, non-standard. Yes, go ahead. I, I was going to say one of the big differences between we were students and students today, uh, I asked a student that was uh, had just finished her senior year in uh, pre-med, and she was going to take a fifth year to take what she wasn't able to take in the four years before. And uh, I said, well, do you guys meet, you know, the pre-med students? And she said, oh, yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, they meet at a place and talk. You know, well, that's not how it's done. It's uh, They meet, they talk on their uh, cell phones, and, uh, you know, they have an email and stuff is basically a meeting. Today, you know, whereas when we were going to school, meeting was people getting together and talking. Also, what's the makeup of UC Merced? It's quite a heavily Hispanic school, or? Uh, it is. Yeah. Uh, it's a, Versus, it's a say, when this school started. And it, I think it, it has the, uh, the highest percentage of students who are the first in their family to go to Yeah. Okay, back here is the gentleman whom I saw start the roll call about which demonstration people were at. So, let's hear from you. Uh, uh, my name's Bill. I'm Crown 73. And I was in David Thomas's Politics 40 class, we think, in 1971. The theme was uh, justice. That's all we talked about all quarter. And I told him before this started, it affected me for my life. It was really a deep... And you're uh, Linda Peterson saying about a different thing about scholarship coming out of high school... This was really a great place for expanding your mind. But my story is there was something called the Alternative Catalog that was published by some radical students. It had a red cover, and it was 
a review of classes and professors that they wouldn't tell you in the real catalog. So you were supposed to, and <laughs> this was mimeographed and sent around campus and the faculty was furious about it because I remember there were some un very unflattering things said about certain people. But one was about Norman O. Brown, who was a brilliant history of consciousness philosopher. I took his class and most of the stuff was way over my head. He spoke in German and Latin and everything, all in this lecture. And I was trying to take part of it. And we had a party afterwards in the quarry at the end of the year where everyone was drinking wine and he was dancing around with a wreath on his head and all that. But in the catalog, it's called him a pathetic Freudian worm. And I'll never forget that. And I was talking during that, when I started the class, I talked to the TA, this woman I think was a grad student. I said that. She goes, oh, and I said, I also heard about the furry pink penis. And I go, that was where a guy came into the big lecture hall, the only one big one there at Nat Sai, and there was a grand piano sitting there. And some guy came uh, with a zipped up costume as a furry pink penis. He did a soft shoe on top of the piano, and Norman O'Brown walked out of the lecture, he just walked out of the hall, and the grad students said they had to talk, uh, Dean McHenry had to talk him into staying at UC Santa Cruz because of that furry pink penis and the pathetic Freudian worm thing. And I take away, I was all laughing when she told me that story, it kind of changed my life also that these are humans and the alternative catalog was all very funny, but the professors were here to do a job and it, ch it changed my attitude about my relationship with professors from then on. I think it may show that the process of uh, flaming did not start with the internet, right? <laughs> so, um, go ahead and over here. Caleb, you got a mic for him. Thank you. Zach Wasserman, um, a founder of Cowell College, Stevenson College, and Merrill College. <laughs> um, I, I am, as many in this room are, I think, disappointed at some of the changes in Santa Cruz. Uh, the loss of pass-fail, the, the minimization of the collegiate system. But on a good note, um, I'm a lawyer in Oakland, and we have hired a reasonable number of Santa Cruz graduates, both as lawyers and clerks. Um, and even in, in the last, continuing to the last few years, there's a difference. There is, uh, I'm not sure I'd say quirkiness, but certainly a, a curiosity and an inquiring mind, and they tend to write better than other hires. So some of the institution well, cultural still works. Kathy. Just to follow up on some of the things you say. Right now I am an interim provost at Bert Kresge and tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock you will see some of the quirkiness. I'm doing a freshman challenge class, which many of the colleges have instituted to bring back those small courses. It, of course, comes from donations of people like you. But uh, in that one, what we have been doing only for a very few weeks now is starting to look at the process of what is going on in this 50th year reunion, study some of those histories, tapping into the oral uh, histories that have been done by the library. I'm glad to see David Thomas and want to let you know that we took a little bit of yours and your early statements. Uh, we don't have that part uh, done for tomorrow. We have one student who wants to do as their final project, Norman O'Brown's Finnegan's Wake. He just gave in a proposal to Stevenson College to ask to be funded to build the coffin so that we can bring him out as hopefully Jim Clifford will play the song that he did about Dooley on that day. So if you want to learn about that project, quirky and puppets built by a bread and puppet uh, circus friend of mine that students have been building for the last couple of weeks. Tomorrow, some of the quirkiness is still found. <laughs> yes, over here. Where, what happened to the mic? Yes, we'll, get, we'll come back. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Sumner White, class of uh, 71 Stevenson. Um, as a military brat coming here, I was really out of my element at first. Uh, mm -hmm. Things changed for me quickly, and I adapted. Uh, one memory that comes to mind, and David brought it up um, when he talked about the community, I remember vividly a meeting that was held in the Commons, I think my freshman year, 
And I was going to ask for comments if people remember that meeting about the uh, antipathy that existed between the Hill and the Flatlanders, the, the community. As I recall, the demographics were so skewed when the college was open. The average age downtown was in the 50s, and, and we were all teenagers practically. And you know, being, coming in 67 was a couple of years after the fact, but if we were still talking about the antipathy you know, two years after the fact, I was going to get comments from the, the faculty. Was it that deep? Was it, and it continued to be so for a couple, couple three years? Because we had a meeting there, and I thought there may have been townspeople up here and sitting at the dais, but it was a big, it was a big deal, as I recall. Responses? Yeah. I, I don't remember uh, that meeting, and I, <clears throat> I think to a great extent we were self-preoccupied. Um, in the, I mean, there was so much going on on, on campus and, and so much to do uh, that we didn't really pay a lot of attention uh, to the town uh, in, initially. Uh, I mean, I'm, the administrators did, of course, but uh, I, don't, I don't remember that as a faculty member. Um, I, I actually, I could speak oh, to that. Okay, so, yeah, go ahead. Densey Nelson, class of 74, Porter. Uh, beginning in 1970, I believe, especially with the Vietnam War protests and the blocking of Highway 1 when they mined Haiphong Harbor and some of that, that suspicion of the older conservative community was, wow, that crazy place up there and the students. But something that brought the community together, I believe it was about 1973 or 74, was the Lighthouse Point Initiative. Remember when there was going to be all the development, the hotel and all of that? Yeah. There was a segment of the society here that wanted to turn it into a little Miami beach. And that was certainly not something that the retirement community wanted. So there was a real sense then of students who were just getting the right to vote then. 18-year-olds just got that right to vote. And were staying here in the community, felt good about this community as uh, with the values that the retirement folks had. So I think there was a coming together that really was sensed. And that kind of began, began that period of time when we were um, the People's Republic of Santa Cruz. And there was a bit of a socialist city government as that the interests of the students and the retired folks were more akin than that middle-aged uh, development sense that was happening. That's what I remember, anyway. OK, back here, yes. Hi, um, Meg Swyback, uh, graduated in 69 from Merrill, started at Cal, went to Stevenson, and then to Merrill. Zach didn't mention that Paige Smith called us Two drunks in search of a better bar. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Linda for reminding me of a number of things. I mean, you just spoke so eloquently of so many memories. You made me think, though, of two things. One is how you were noticed for your quiet voice, which I think was uh, what was very common for women in those days, that we were noticed if we were quiet, um, sometimes. Um, and the, the comments about our appearance. And one of the things I'm noticing is, is that that was the era. It's, it's not a, a fault, certainly, of the guys we were going to school with, but it's being echoed even in the comments here today, which have been mostly from men, because the founding students, the voice that was being heard was of men um, and boys. Uh, when my younger son came to look at colleges, we, he was on the way over through Scotts Valley. He was saying, God, you know, it's never going to be the same as when you were there, you know. So cool. Wouldn't it have been great to go to school at that time? And I said, well, you know, it was pretty exciting in a lot of ways, but it was exciting because of change. And to have that kind of change, you're changing from something. And that only happened at the time we were graduating, especially our last year. Um, and we walked on campus. We passed parked by the field house. And as we walked by, there was a big group of women in a self-defense class. And I looked at him, I said, Michael, I got to tell you something. Not only did we not have a women's self-defense class then, it never occurred to us that we needed one. Hmm. And that, I mean, it's, it's an era, it's long past. We had some fabulous women, but we were quiet in terms of our voices for much of that time. Thank you. Did you have a comment? Oh, yes, I saw your hand down front here. C 
Suzanne Herring, uh, Cal class of 69 from the trailers. Uh, I was at, uh, I attended a class 8 a.m. the very first day the campus opened. <laughs> and, and I would like to, to sort of comment on something that people don't associate with Santa Cruz, which is what a wonderful school it was to be a science major. And, and it's because of the intimacy and the uh, closeness with faculty that Linda referred to uh, by third quarter physics, th with, there were only seven of us. <laughs> and and uh, it's, it's interesting too now that uh, one colleague I have, who's a professor at UC Berkeley that I have worked with for the last 12 years very closely, uh, when we first started working together, uh, he sends me his CV because we're submitting a proposal <coughs> together, and there it was, University of California, Santa Cruz. I'm 69, he was 89. My major was this quirky physics and history. His major, chemistry and politics. <laughs> and as Zach said, he can write very well. <laughs> Experience like uh, Greg did. I used to come here a lot to visit friends. I also went to Davis and Berkeley, uh, and I took a summer course in uh, migrant education. I was with uh, Ralph Guzman. We would go over to Salinas uh, four days a week and work with migrant students. At that time, all the teachers spoke English. All the students spoke Spanish. They had a group of uh, student teachers that came up from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo that were migrant students before and were basically taking over the classes and teaching them. And it was like heaven came to Salinas. I mean, it was like the kids had never seen anything like this, and it was wonderful. And uh, you know, it's my one experience at Santa Cruz, but it was wonderful. And also, like you, it was just a vibrant place to come and spend time and take, you know, go in classes and stuff. The other thing was last night at the lecture on nature, wonderful lecture, uh, there was a house on a little boat that was by one of the buildings up in performing arts. And there's a student here that went down to Mississippi last summer, and he's going to do it again this summer, stops at small towns and takes oral histories of people from those small towns. Interesting. Yes, go ahead. I was founding uh, at Crown, and then I moved to Merrill. I was an RA and, uh, in my sophomore year, and, I helped, and then I was at uh, creating Kresge. So my memories of those beginning years was... And the reason I came to Santa Cruz was because of the smaller community feeling and uh, contact with uh, the professors and all of the students, that real um, community building. And that's what my degree was in development of community consciousness. And so we had, a, as students, we had a lot more, because we had a lot of younger faculty and we were all creating it together, we had a lot more power in creating our education. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, moving to Merrill and we're in our core course and it's about the third world and I'm looking around and going, this is all lectures. What, what, how is anybody gonna get, gonna get a feeling of what the third world's really like? So I went down to Watsonville and went to the agricultural day center there, found out that they do a training. And so I, I suggested, how about if we all students go and have that experience. So that's what we did. We uh, all had to go and be a day laborer. Um, and moving on to, I was one of the first volunteers in the Peace Corps through um, Merrill College. And I was, uh, and when I came back, they had Creating Kresge College, uh, a course. And so we, as students, got to interview faculty, uh, new uh, faculty coming on, got to work with the architects, change their ideas from a big bathroom. That's where all the students get together. No, thank you. A kitchen so we can cook our own healthy food. All of these things were available to us in interaction with the faculty and creating the whole direction of the college. So that was very important. And I don't know about being a quiet woman and having a quiet voice. No, we got to come out and participate in the People's Park March and uh, create our own uh, 
um, directions of what we wanted to do and what we wanted our majors to be. So that was fabulous. Thank you. Yes, I'll take a few more comments and then I want to give them a chance to have the last word. So down here. So I wanted to share two different things. I'm Nancy Coleman and I was in the founding class at Stevenson and then became in, went to Merrill and was in the founding class there and graduated in 1970. Two things that I wanted to say that I thought were remarkable of our freshman year is that in the quarter that Peter Kenaz taught the core course, he had assigned a book which was unavailable in the bookstores. So he and Penny went to Berkeley and managed to go to the used bookstores and pick up 250 copies of this used book so that we would have that book for the core course. You don't remember this, Peter, but I mean, because it said something to me when I went away to graduate school. Because I, people said to me, you're going to the University of Michigan, it's just like being in Berkeley. But there was no used bookstore, much less enough used bookstores to be able to find Peter's assigned book. Um, so I think that, that that relationship was a very valuable one to me as a student to be able to have that kind of dialogue. I remember Carolyn Elliott talking about her first study of the civil service in, in uh, India and explaining the differences of that civil service system to us at, at a group dinner one night talking about that in relation to the civil service in the United States, something that we may or may not have understood as freshmen, but certainly we understood what the India system was and being able to participate in it. The next comment is, is that yes, I went off to the University of Michigan and I was so traumatized by the faculty member who handed back a series of papers in um, ascending order of grades. Now maybe other people in the class in this class, this graduate uh, seminar of mine didn't realize that, but I sure as hell did, having not had anything. And I hope, Meg, that I was one of those vociferous women at that day, rather than the quiet one. And so I take <laughs> off on that. But you were a year younger. <laughs> <laughs> I see the generational distinctions emerge. <laughs> I feel like marching you all off to a local StoryCorps booth so that you can testify before you leave campus. Okay, I see two more hands up and then I'm going to cut it off. So one here and one there. Hi, I'm Paul Gilbert, uh, class of 77.5. My dorm room was right there and I have to say it was my roommate who kept putting the speakers out the window, blasting the KZSC where I was a disc jockey because we got complaints from the library just about every day. Um, I grew up in Fort Lee, New Jersey, which you probably now know is where Chris Christie's decided we needed a traffic problem. <laughs> but I decided I wanted to go to school in California, and I was in the guidance counselor's office. You know, I had that big white book you used to look through for colleges. Didn't tell me all that much, but somehow um, I got UC Santa Cruz on my radar, and then I went to a bookstore, and there was a little thing called The Hip Guide to Choosing a College, a little black book. I opened up UC Santa Cruz. It said it's 2,000 acres overlooking Monterey Bay, and it said, kilo cleaning parties are preferred to powder puff football. <laughs> so I thought, well, that was kind of interesting. And um, the one thing I do remember, amongst other things, I was allowed to invent my own major here. I got three professors, and I invented a major called the politics of mass media. There was no media department at the time. And uh, as in addition to being a disc jockey, I was, I, my brother and I had a sports show on the radio here, Sports Rap, which we did yesterday, again, for the first time in 37 years. But there's, we taught a class called Sports and Society, which was sponsored by Wally Goldfrank in the sociology department. And I'm looking at the curriculum, and it's still there. <laughs> so I'm hoping that that kind of spirit is still here at the university, because it really was a really good school when I went here. And it was really hard to get into out of state. They, they rejected me. I was the president of my class, the editor of the paper, and a straight-A student, and they rejected me. And I had to write an essay appeal. So I just hope that energy is still here, and it's just wonderful to be on the campus. So, thank you. Well, one last. last. Last comment. According to the list for the lunch, is Jim Clute here? I, okay, I, I couldn't find him in the, in the mess. I, I couldn't find him in the mess. My name's Lee Wilson, and I'm one of the transfer juniors who graduated the two-year class of 67. No. So, my experience was 
as a, one of the three chem majors, many of my chem classes were three people. My o, my o chem lecture was five people. The O chem lab was seven people because we had two biologists. And there were three long rows of, you know, chem, chemistry's long rows of bench. And there were six sides and seven people. What, two people had to share a side of the bench. And the trick was the, the professor ran it as an industrial class. Because we had a whole side of the bench, we had three to five experiments going at once as if we were in a research lab or an analytical lab, and we needed this test and this test and this test run, and we'd run things overnight and be at the lab at four in the morning watching things bubble and such. My, uh, my very best friend was one of the three people in physics. I had to take physics, and my calculus wasn't good. Without Mike Farnett, I would never have passed that class. He teaches at a college in, in South Dakota, and we keep, we keep up and we fly back and forth, and he's, his mother's 92 and is still out here, so he comes out once in a while. But anyway, size-wise, my uh, Stevenson back then was politics or political science or whatever they called it back then, but, you know, it was... So, and languages for, for politics. So my German, my third-year German class was 11 people. I took one math course that actually had 15 people in it. That was a huge class. So I had a, I'm going to pronounce it as Socratic education that could never be, never be duplicated. Thank you. I, I much I, more than anybody. I want to give them a chance for the last Thank word. You. Thank you very much. Final comments, any of you? Well, um, as Greg's remark su suggested, um, people should realize, I mean, there's a lot of good feeling in this room and a lot of good memories, but should also remember that Santa Cruz has always been controversial. UCSC has always been controversial. Um, and it's had ups and downs in reputation. We talk about the earliest years when um, we were more selective than, than Berkeley um, in the 70s. Within 10 years, the popularity of Santa Cruz had so declined and the economics and politics had turned that there were actually plans to, pos to mothball this campus. There, there were confidential plans which, um, w which were worked on. Um, and we're uh, an example of what not to follow uh, for, for some places. An, an example, I think the pithiest um, statement of the negative view, uh, which also grew out of the famous regents meeting uh, at Crown, uh, I hope someone has a picture of uh, Dean McHenry kicking a student, uh, <laughs> which occurred that day. Yes. But uh, Max Max Rafferty, we had a very not a notorious state su state superintendent of education who was a regent uh, and who was asked about Santa Cruz some in when the the weeks after this event, and Max Rafferty said of UCSC, it's a cross between a brothel and a hippie pad. <laughs> he, he left for Alabama shortly thereafter. <laughs> but for, my, for, for myself, um, and I'm, I'll quote something from, from Cowell, of which there, I've always been a participant in the Stevenson-Cowell uh, rivalry and wouldn't use it, but I think uh, the Cowell model um, motto um, is the way I think about Santa Cruz at its best, uh, the pursuit of truth in the company of friends. Uh, I'm going to do my wrap-up comments wearing my foundation trustee hat. To the extent that you you know, have these wonderful memories and fond memories. We should realize that we were, we, we did go to Santa College at a wonderful time in the state of California where the state was paying 80% of the bill. And that doesn't happen anymore. So each and every one of us, and, and I think because of that, and because many of us were first time generation, we didn't realize the importance of alumni and alumni contributions giving back. 
So uh, what I'm going to do is urge you to remember your university. And one of the ways you can do that is the 21st Century Fund, which is a, basically saying, I'll remember Santa Cruz in my will. Uh, you'll see some of us wearing those badges. Um, we're alive, so that tells you there isn't a hit plan to knock you off. <laughs> I have to admit that I was a little concerned about that, that that would be it. But it counts toward our campaign. We have an extremely modest campaign. It's our very first time after 50 years, Santa Cruz is finally reaching out and has done its first campaign. And we're trying to reach $300 million. We're about two thirds of the way there. But those funds that come in for us and from, from all of us make a big difference at this campus. They're, they fill needs and unique spots all throughout the campus. They enable all sorts of wonderful opportunities and things that wouldn't happen but for uh, alumni and other friends of the campus stepping up. And if you valued this experience, please, please think about how much about giving back. It doesn't have to be a huge sum. Every sum makes a difference. And it's really, you know, you know, my dad was a bricklayer, my mom a secretary. But for the UC system, you know, I don't think I would have been able to have the life I've had. And so to me, that's one of the reasons why I give back. So I'm really, um, my final plea is to say, if you enjoyed it, we had great memories, there's wonderful things here, give back. Actually, just in, in the course of the comments, a couple of, of memories came back. One is that there was a course here called The Life and Times of Rosenstock Hussey. Perhaps some, some of you took it there. And uh, my memory is that there were three senior professors teaching that, and they had something like five students. Uh, obviously, that if that occurred today, uh, there would be an investigation by the state legislature. But that was the sort of thing that was, that was possible back then. Uh, about the reputation of Santa Cruz as being a radical place, uh, if you were there at the graduation in 1969, uh, <laughs> you may remember, yeah, there was a speech given by, uh, that had been written by SDS, I understand, by one of the, the graduates. And, uh, a lot of it was, I thought, uh, Kant or, you know, the running dog imperialist lackey sort of stuff. Uh, but there was also a little bit of theater there that Dean McHenry was actually giving out the diplomas. And there was uh, one student who decided that uh, uh, she was not going to receive this diploma. And so she actually, McHenry gave it to her and she took it and she pushed it back. And McHenry pushed it toward her, and she pushed it back. <laughs> and you had this very strange phenomenon. Um, and a lot of the a uh, lot of the people in the uh, a lot of people, the graduates, were wearing black armbands because this was the time of Vietnam. Uh, one thing that wasn't mentioned was the siege of Central Services, as we called it, back in 1969, where we. Uh, Shut down Central Services, padlock, chain the uh, the entrance, and the uh, and some students took the flag down and put it back up upside down, and a delegation of of um, uh, residents came up here and took it down and put it right side up, uh, so that there was you know th this was questioning authority and there was there were bad town gown relations certainly, but just on a final point, um, being a history major, I was interested in sort of collecting the artifacts of the time, so I. Uh, and I sort of dug through my memorabilia and found some of the, the buttons that I collected back then. Uh, make Love Not War, uh, SDS. Uh, one that I don't have is uh, Students for Kennedy, Kennedy for Students. Uh, this is the RFK campaign because I took that button off and threw it away on the, the night of the assassination. But then uh, there was the march, we then went off to the East Coast, there's the March on Washington, 1969. And to show that, that the more things change, et cetera, no tuition. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that it was the first time, uh, and I think this was 1969, it must have been, that the university decided that they were going to impose something that wasn't a fee per se, but it, it was, or maybe they called it a fee, but it really was the first occasion of tuition. And I, my memory is it was something like $123 a quarter. Uh, Okay, there I stand corrected. Very good, thank you. Oh, quarter. Okay, well, we can find out. <laughs> In any case, that was uh, our the, the the other button that people wore was our position, no tuition. Peter, any last words? Peter has no last words. <laughs> But he will be available to answer questions and chat with any of you, as will the rest of the panelists. Please join me in thanking them and thank all of you.